Hello, I recently released an action superhero thriller called The Spider Queen, available now in fine online bookstores. It's based on the character Shannon Kane, who helmed a short-lived comic book series in 1941. Perhaps you're considering purchasing this book, but you would like a sample before making the financial commitment. So here's chapter one, free of charge, storybook style. Enjoy the show. The Spider Queen by Austin McConnell and Elizabeth McIver. Chapter One Shannon Kane was late. Veering between cars on the expressway, she cranked the throttle on her white Kawasaki and checked her mirrors for any officers running radar that morning. For once, the coast was clear. Cutting off a black minivan with an apologetic wave, Shannon sped past the honking horn and exited. She hated reckless riding, but the future of scientific discovery could very well be at stake. Plus, the bagels were getting cold. She hung a left into the lab's parking lot and made her way to the back of the building. Finding the loading garage still open, against protocol, she coasted through, stopped at her parking spot, threw out the kickstand, and shut the bike off. Her phone chirped as she flipped up the bike storage bin to retrieve Henry's files and breakfast. Think forgot red folder. Will you bring two? H. Shannon rolled her eyes and switched the phone off, returning it to her back pocket. Her husband for all his genius, was a terrible texter. She removed her helmet and let her short auburn hair fall free, catching the chilly autumn breeze as it swept through the small industrial park that played home to Kane Advanced Research and Technology, Henry's lab, their lab. CART wasn't some multi-billion dollar operation by any means, but the four letters plastered across the modest building represented everything about her husband's unrelenting curiosity and her dogged determination. It was the crowning jewel of eight years of marriage and professional partnership. It was everything. Shannon fished into her jacket pocket and pulled out her key card. Then, tapping it to the back door's scanner, she gave a knowing wave to the always ominous security camera trained on her. Its eerie red light blinked twice, and the door's magnetic lock clanked open. She stepped into the building and punched the garage door button on the wall. Making her way past a row of lockers, she caught sight of a man in a white lab coat, hunched over, and looking into one of the hall's storage closets. You may need to nuke your breakfast, love, she called out with a smile, tossing the paper bag onto a nearby counter. I already ate, but I sure appreciate you thinking of me, Mrs. Kane. Almost immediately, her face turned sour. The white coat stood upright, and Shannon instead saw Joel Piper, Cart's latest and only laboratory technician. He grinned at her with that typical aw shucks face that so easily got under her skin, and Shannon quickly returned the smile through gritted teeth. Borrowing Henry's jacket? She asked. Mine's folded neatly on the top of my dryer back home, freshly cleaned and freshly forgotten. How do I look? He said, straightening the collar playfully. Uh, distinguished, of course, she answered flatly. Grabbing Henry's breakfast, she made her way across the hall and toward the door to the lobby. The loading bay was open, she said. Oops, he said. Could we try to remember that? It's the second time this week. My bad. Joel stepped in front of Shannon to get the door, breaking her stride and further irritating her. Excited about the Linac? Boss man seems pretty stoked. Shannon fought back her growing urge to push past him and worked to maintain her smile. Boys and their toys. <laughs> Joel opened the door with an annoying laugh, and Shannon entered the lobby. Cart's main entrance was a sleekly designed vestibule that utterly betrayed the building's drab exterior. Its marble floors were the black of a cosmic void, treated with a dust-repellent serum that Henry had developed one summer to maintain the flawless darkness. Likewise, they'd kept the walls stark white, studded with several large canvases showing different proteins at a microscopic level. Apart from the room's sharp acrylic logo hanging on the wall, the only other decor was a 70s-style orange couch that Henry had insisted was non-negotiable. Ugly as it was, Shannon at least comforted herself by knowing that the lab never had visitors to see it. 
CART was what Shannon called a ghost lab, a small operation funded almost exclusively by government grants earmarked for seemingly banal research and development. It was the kind of thing that certain congressional candidates often scored easy political points mocking. Five- and six-figure government checks sent here and there to a business that existed mostly on paper. CART was really just Henry and Shannon, plus whatever broke college students they could find willing to slog through low-level clerical work on a quarterly contract. In truth, the Keynes lab was doing well just to keep the lights on from month to month, while the random assortment of oddball experiments was perfect for her husband's eclectic interests, CART's funding was constantly in jeopardy. Their latest endeavor was a six-month development trial for an alternative renewable energy source, and the money had slowed to a trickle. Hopefully, today would change that. Ignoring the elevator, Shannon jogged down the metal stairs to the basement. She swiped her keycard and opened the door to the lab, grabbing her coat from the corner rack and draping it over her shoulder till she could reach a table to set down her husband's files and breakfast. Knock, knock, Shannon said. Henry Kane looked up from his work and smiled. He wore a pair of enormous goggles over his face, and his Sushian appearance made Shannon snort. Did you get my text? He asked. I, uh, forgot some files on the kitchen counter. Shannon threw her white coat on and brought the bulging red folder over to him. You don't have to sign your name after every text, love. I know it's you by now. Henry grinned and flipped the polarized lenses of the goggles up, revealing a brilliant set of magnified eyeballs underneath. Do I smell bagels? Shannon snorted again fondly. She slid the frames up to his salt and pepper hair and kissed him. Good morning, Dr. Kane. And good morning to you too, Dr. Kane. Henry popped the bagels into the break room's microwave and skimmed through the red folder as Shannon did her best to spruce things up. The tables sat littered with fast food, candy wrappers, and half-completed reports. I thought we agreed Piper would be on janitorial duty this month, she said. He's been busy upstairs. Loading bay was left open. Again. Shan. Joel Piper's work ethic, or lack thereof, had been a continued point of contention between Henry and Shannon over the past few months. Still in his early 20s, he showed intelligence beyond the usual temporary hire, but he had a smugness that got under Shannon's skin. On the other hand, her husband seemed to have a soft spot for him, likely stemming from the impeccable references he brought from Henry's alma mater. Just making you aware, love, she said. I'll talk to him, Henry said burning his fingertips as he pulled his breakfast out of the microwave. Preliminaries are all checked. Figured we'd go whenever. Henry had been working the graveyard shift, anticipating the morning's experiment. Shannon noticed the bags under his eyes as he flipped through the red folder, removed a few pages, and pinned them to the wall. Her husband was old school, almost a decade shy of the switch to digital. His organizational methods were diametrically opposed to hers. The break room walls were barely visible, lined with Henry's cork boards and Shannon's smart boards, carrying all kinds of notes, reminders, and schedules. Henry had always been a bit of a whirlwind when it came to experimentation, but he was undoubtedly well-documented, assuming you valued volume over clarity. What he lacked in structure was made up for in creative genius. While Henry ran from one project to another, making breakthroughs, Shannon fought the never-ending battle to keep the lab's workstations neat, scrupulously labeling equipment, and always returning things to where they belonged. She sat on one of the room's wheeled stools and scrolled through the day's itinerary on her tablet. The morning's work centered around what Cart had dubbed the Tundra Specimen. Although government grants almost exclusively funded the lab, there was rarely any oversight in the methods used to produce results. Plenty of labs around the country may have been guilty of shameless and downright unethical practices to achieve their ends, but the Keynes viewed it as a point of pride to keep their reputation beyond reproach. So when Henry had approached Shannon with his intent to experiment under the table on an as-of-yet unclassified specimen from a recently defrosted region of Antarctica, received via an anonymous supplier, she was less than enthused. The whole thing sounded like Jurassic Park waiting to happen, 
but Henry had promised that he would trash the entire project the moment she felt compelled to shout, Mad Scientist. Admittedly, the goofy goggles and reams of handwritten notes strewn about the lab were starting to push it. Henry brewed some coffee and pulled up a stool across the table. Everything look okay on the schedule? I had Joel help me. He said. Help you? I talked, he typed, and then he did whatever you're supposed to do to make it appear on the tablets. The cloud, love. He uploaded it to the cloud. Yes, fine. Does it make sense? Shannon set her tablet on the table and grabbed a bagel from the bag. Yes, dear, everything's scheduled properly. He synced it with the lab's computer system, so everything will get logged as we work. Good. No, not good, she answered. I still have no idea what it is we're working on. I told you I'm not scrubbing in until I get brought up to speed. Henry rubbed his eyes, annoyed. He spread his hands out on the table and cleared his throat, the way he did before entering lecture mode. The Tundra specimen was recently recovered from a remote region in Antarctica. We've been enlisted to, to examine and document its unique properties when exposed to various lights and sounds. Yes, save me the rehearsed spiel. What is it? Insect? Fish? So help me, Henry, if you're making me cut up a penguin. It's just flora, Shan. It's a flower. Shannon stared at him. A flower? Yes. Well, maybe flora-like, at least. Maybe fungi. From the South Pole. Yep. She set her bagel down. We're going to shoot the Linac at an unknown flora that your mystery friend found deep in Antarctica? And shoot sounds at it. Henry added, raising a finger. To create renewable energy? Well, that's the idea. Am I allowed to tell you this sounds stupid? She asked. And this is why we didn't talk about it. He mused. Shannon rolled her eyes and balled the paper bag up, standing to toss it into the trash can. She missed and walked over to drop it in. Henry continued his speech unabated. We know from the initial report provided by the client that the flora displays abnormal readings at a molecular level and emits some kind of electrical field on occasion. The goal today is to recreate previous reactions and document steps used to trigger them. You've ensured this isn't just the elaborate prank of a scorned student? Shan, it's a favor to an old pal. They've had me do crazier things and to crazier results. Who knows, maybe we can fold the results into some of the grant work Trust me, I could be wrong, but I don't think I am. Shannon gritted her teeth in the kind of adoring frustration only marriage brings out. I could be wrong, but I don't think I am was the line Henry used whenever he was right on the money about something. She finally smiled and then turned to him. All right, love, she said affectionately. Let's go shoot lasers at your magic mushroom. Maybe we can be done by lunch. Joel emerged from the elevator, pushing heavy equipment with a cheesy smile that made Shannon's skin crawl. With one hand on the Linac and one hand on a small, mirrorless camera, he spoke into its lens with an obnoxiously over-the-top cadence like a teacher might use for small children. Our next stop is the airlock chamber. Once we move this baby into position, we'll be locked and loaded for today's mission. After that, Commander Kane will lead us to victory. Two hands on the instruments, please, Piper, Shannon muttered. Joel snapped to attention and saluted. Yes, ma'am. He hit a button on the camera to stop the recording and stuffed it into his coat pocket. Sorry. He said with a laugh. Just trying to get a more dynamic angle. Shannon opened and then closed her mouth, catching Henry's side-eye glance. Joel's got it under control, Shan. He said, nodding to him. Joel smiled and steered the Linac toward the testing chamber. Once, mostly out of earshot, Shannon shot a look at Henry. It's a waste of time to move equipment out of the airlock just so he can record himself moving it back in, she said. Henry answered with a shrug. Something about creating a story? Let him have a little fun. At least it keeps things interesting around here. Since being hired, Joel had taken to moonlighting as the lab's quasi-educational YouTuber, documenting the ins and outs at CART. 
Shannon thought this self-appointed role was not only annoying, but fruitless. Most of Joel's videos barely cracked a dozen views, looked like a junior high schooler edited them, and, worst of all, distracted from his day-to-day -day lab duties. A bickering about the YouTube thing had lasted nearly a week between the Canes and had ultimately ended in Henry granting permission, provided Shannon had the final say in what could appear on camera. Ever mindful of the lab's confidential intellectual property, she found the idea of a rogue cameraman running around completely abhorrent and wished that Henry understood the need for caution. We're all green, Henry announced, punching a final command into a nearby terminal. The light overhead flickered on, and the two joined Joel in the airlock. The Linac made things a tight fit. As the chamber's air pressure shifted, Joel again pulled the camera out of his pocket and pointed it toward him and Henry, selfie style. Shannon made sure to step out of frame. Commander Kane, tell our viewers about this incredible piece of machinery. Joel slapped the top of the Linac like a used car salesman. Shannon cringed. Henry smiled and looked into the camera lens, speaking in professor mode. The Linac, or Linear Particle Accelerator, is a kit that's seen a lot of use over the past few years at CART. A beam of accelerated electrons is passed through a high-voltage emitter and directed toward a target. Today, we'll use it to increase the velocity of charged subatomic ions in our specimen, and we'll then observe and measure whatever reactions occur. Yawn, said Piper, adding an annoying stretch for emphasis. Lot of science talk for most of us. Can we maybe put it in English? Shannon balled her fist. It's a giant laser. We shoot it at things. Simple enough? Piper grinned. Sounds fun to me. Who wouldn't want a laser gun? Henry held up a finger with a grin. No, no. We're not just shooting blindly. We learn things about the specimen by watching how it reacts. We'll take various readings, record the experiment on several cameras, and then study the results before writing a report for the client. Hey, Doc, didn't some dude in Russia accidentally get hit in the face with a beam of 70 billion electron volts and somehow survive? Why, yes, Henry said, in far too scripted a manner. His name is Anatoly Bugorsky. He recently turned 80, actually. Doors opening, Shannon interrupted. With a loud clang of metal hydraulics, the door to the test chamber hissed and opened. Shannon quickly made her way inside. Henry and Joel followed suit, and minutes later, the Linac was locked into place. All right, Commander, I've got us into position and am ready to head to the monitoring station. Any last words in case our laser cannon backfires? Henry made a goofy face, playing along with Joel as he shook his camera roughly, mocking an explosion. No chance of that happening, Lieutenant Piper. The Linac we use is locked to a lower power level to prevent accidents like Mr. Bogorski's. Unfortunately, the only one who can disengage these safety measures is my assistant across the room. And you can take my word for it that she's never in the mood to have that much fun. Shannon rolled her eyes and gave a look to Henry, which he returned gleefully. Still, it wouldn't be a good idea to get in the beam's path, so we'll take extra special care to be safe. Kane Advanced Research and Technology takes all our experiments seriously. Joel pocketed his camera and stepped out of the room, heading to his usual position outside the chamber's monitoring station. He quickly waved through the window once he logged into his terminal. Shannon watched as Henry unlocked a reinforced storage chest and pulled out a small container, bringing it to the chamber's center work table. This is our mysterious specimen, then? Shannon asked, nodding toward the container as she handed Henry his goofy goggles. It is, indeed, Henry said, turning to allow her a glimpse. Shannon furrowed her brow. That is not what I was expecting. At all, she said, blinking in surprise. The flower, contained in a glass jar, was a bright and rich pink. It was also far larger than Shannon thought it would be. She'd been expecting a bloom that had fought for a meager existence in the Antarctic tundra, perhaps getting to the size of a forget-me-not. Instead, this was more like the heavy, luscious head of a summer peony. It was large enough that Henry needed both gloved hands to lift it out of its protective shell and place it on one of the lab's large testing trays. The tundra specimen wasn't just barely alive. It was thriving. The client asked that we keep the specimen as intact as possible for testing. So, we're only going to clip a few petals off for initial readings, rather than dividing the whole flower. Henry said breathlessly, carrying it to the Linax treatment couch. 
The two of them fell into a familiar pattern as they prepped the chamber and the specimen for the experiment, a process they had nearly perfected after several years together. Shannon felt an invisible electric current of excitement in the air. As Henry passed by her, Shannon caught him by the belt loops. Hey. Hey. He answered, a small, stupid grin on his face. I like you, she said, kissing him. Henry rolled his eyes. Why is it the only time you're flirty is when we're in the middle of lab work? She tapped his oversized eyewear with a smile. Must be these dorky goggles. Getting you hot under the collar? Steaming. Let's keep it PG, you two. Henry gave her a peck on the cheek and returned to his station. With speed and efficiency, he used sterilized tweezers to remove three of the strangely plump pink petals. Each one reminded Shannon of a pair of pouting lips and was placed into its own Petri dish for independent testing. Shannon stepped over to her instrument panel and typed the last necessary commands into the console. She caught sight of Joel through the observation window, scurrying about the various screens and ensuring the lab's documentation recorders were online. Eerie red lights of an array of cameras switched on overhead. We're hot, Joel called. From that point forward, whatever happened in the chamber would be recorded for future reference. Shannon had set the system up herself. An array of cameras sporting CCD, EMCCD, CMOS, and ICCD sensors would capture feeds using a variety of formats. Analog, digital, thermal, and more. Microphones also hung from the ceiling, allowing complete audio documentation of experiments should she or Henry note anything aloud during their tests. Henry often dictated notes into an old audio cassette recorder, but Shannon preferred the versatility and dependability of her hands-free system. The level of redundancy was threefold. First, each device had its own internal storage. Second, each microphone and camera was wired to send a separate feed to the lab's computer server, giving anyone at CART with the proper access credentials the ability to review it. Third, while recording, a digital backup was simultaneously copied to an array of hard drives kept on site. Shannon was always the better safe than sorry type when it came to her work. All right then, let's get started. Henry's voice was warm. He nodded to Shannon, and she walked to the back of the LINAC to scan her keycard. The machine beeped, and there were several sharp snaps as she released the catches on the control panel cage. Then, after quickly typing in her authorization code, the panel beeped, and she placed her hand on a large metal knob with ten notches, which controlled the laser's intensity. Shannon clicked the knob to the first position, and the Lynac hummed like a dragon roused from sleep. A concentrated beam sprang from the machine, resting just in front of the small specimen sample on the testing mat. Henry cleared his throat. This is Dr. Henry Kane, CART scientist, Experiment 23 Tango Sierra. Assisting me, as usual, is Dr. Shannon Kane. Good morning, Shannon grinned. Monitoring from outside the chamber is Joel Piper. Good morning. Henry adjusted his goggles and stepped closer to the machine. Specimen in position, beam active, will now make contact. Shannon nodded and placed her hand on the Linax control lever. Adjusting beam to the center position, she said. With a push, the laser smoothly inched toward the pink petal and made contact. Boom! Joel shouted from above. Shannon yelped and cursed, and Henry laughed. Piper! She called up to the microphones. Absolutely inappropriate while we're testing. Yeah, ease up, Shan. Henry said. Sorry, Mrs. Kane. Shannon stared daggers at Henry, who offered a sheepish shrug. Anything interesting in the readings? He asked, motioning toward the sample. There's not much happening visually. Shannon looked over at the large monitor across from her in a huff. There may be something happening with the electrical fields, but it's small. Not what your client will want to hear, I imagine. Let me take a look, he said. Shannon raised an eyebrow. Henry seldom checked her assessments in the lab anymore. Why was he so nannyish with this sample? Henry lifted his goggles and made his way over. Shannon gave up her seat and watched as her husband stared intently at the monitor, scrolling back and forth through the incoming data. You recalibrated after Joel took the machine out? Yes, love. He leaned back and rubbed his eyes, annoyed. Yeah, there's definitely something on a molecular level that's getting excited by the charge, but it's too small to read accurately. 
Should I increase power? Henry thought for a moment and shook his head. Nah, I don't want to risk a power outage. The Linac had a habit of tripping the lab's main circuit breaker. Although a backup system was installed, it usually took around 15 seconds to turn on, and resetting everything was always a headache. Okay then, Shannon said. Maybe a bigger sample? Henry nodded and rose from the seat. Shannon disengaged the beam. Maybe combine a few of the dishes, she suggested. Think I've got a better idea. Whistling to himself, Henry walked over to the flower and moved it onto the testing mat. Wait a minute, the whole thing? Shannon said. Why not? Oh, I don't know. Which of the dozens of reasons would you like to hear first? Shannon said incredulously. Let's start with the most obvious. You got one specimen, Chief. Burn that and you're toast. Henry smiled at her and lowered his goggles. Trust me. Henry. Shan, I'm serious. I've got a good feeling. I could be wrong, but I don't think... Fine, whatever, she said, waving her hand dismissively. It's your experiment to ruin. Henry backed away, and Shannon restarted the Linac. A familiar hum filled the room, and a beam of light released from the already aligned machine, hitting the flower dead center. Shannon stared at her monitor and assessed the readings. Okay, starting to get something here. Eyes locked on the specimen, Henry muttered to himself. Fascinating. I've never seen a reaction like this before. Shannon almost stood to see what he was looking at, but the incoming data stream stole her attention. Henry, I'm not sure if the calibration is still off, but I'm reading crazy energy spikes. Then, all at once, the readout froze. Shan, you gotta see this. Shannon peeked above the monitor. Henry was standing next to the machine, dumbfounded. The pink flower was glowing. What in the... In a flash, the whole room filled with a blistering white light. Shannon's hands instinctively slapped over her eyes, and the lab erupted in chaos. The control panels shrieked warnings. The lights flickered. The Linac shuddered as its emergency safety mechanism triggered. Keeping her eyes tightly shut, Shannon dropped to her knees and plugged her ears. The mania lasted for only a handful of seconds. The burning against her eyelids lessened, and Shannon peeked out to see the brilliant light shift to a calm pink hue. As she stood, she punched a button on the control panel. The wailing next to her ears abruptly stopped, though the other sirens around the lab continued. Henry! Henry, are you okay? Henry was already standing, staring intently at the testing table through his goggles. Still dazzled by the pink light, he turned to Shannon as she approached. They locked eyes and then looked back to the flower. Except, it wasn't a flower anymore. The specimen had slowly been morphing into an oozing, gelatinous goo that pulsed gently atop the platform. There was no sign of its previous form, only a perfectly filled petri dish. As the room's pink light finally settled, Henry stepped over to a chair across the lab and slowly sat. So... He said. That happened. The Spider Queen will return in just a moment, but first, special thanks to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. If you've got a creation or a business that you want to share with the world, they help make it easy to start your own website. Begin by choosing from one of their stunning templates, and then use their new Fluid Engine to customize it to your specific needs. You can use their Member Areas feature to host exclusive video content for your online community, and if you've got something to sell, their online storefront can get you set up in no time. You can check it all out today with a free trial from squarespace.com. Give it a shot. If you like the experience, then when you're ready to launch your site in full, head over to squarespace.com slash Austin McConnell to save 10% on your first purchase of a website or domain. Thanks again, and now back to the show. Did we nearly just die? I think we nearly just died. Joel's voice over the loudspeaker was an oddly welcome shot of reality. Shannon turned to look at him from within the chamber. You were perfectly safe behind reinforced glass. Henry and I were the ones in danger. Come look at the specimen, Joel. Henry motioned. Might be the only chance you get. Uh, I think I've got as close to that thing as I need. I'm going out for a cigarette, see if it stops my hands from shaking. 
Henry frowned as Joel left, clearly disappointed at the young man's lack of enthusiasm. You okay? He asked Shannon. She nodded. I think so. What did we just do? No idea. He said. Isn't it wonderful? Henry, we weren't in protective gear. We... we should quarantine. Henry stepped over to the pink fluid on the table, which still bore a visible yet controlled glow. He pulled a pipette from a supply chest and quickly drew a sample of the mysterious substance. I don't feel funny. Do you? Shannon rolled her eyes. Is that how we judge exposure to unknown materials? If they make us feel funny? Within moments, Henry had collected what remained of the tundra specimen into a large glass vial, placing it safely into a specialized silver storage case and punching in a lock on its keypad. I don't know, Shan. We've got dinner at Gilardi's tonight. Reservations took forever. Henry. All right, fine. We'll do the dumb protocol. Henry closed the footlocker and set it down next to the Linac. Joel can handle things upstairs. He's not even handling things down here, Shannon grumbled. Let him settle his nerves. If I smoked, I'd need a cigarette after that, too. Henry and Shannon reset the lab equipment and then took a break. Joel eventually returned to find himself with a laundry list of errands. CART's containment protocol dictated that any potentially dangerous exposure should be closely monitored for 24 hours before affected personnel could leave the facility. The plan had never been enacted in the lab's history and had only been drawn up by Shannon in the first place due to a requirement from one of their research grants. Now it had ruined the Kane's dinner plans. The couple eventually settled on Chinese takeout, which Joel fetched from across town and then delivered through the testing chamber's mini airlock. Henry was fizzing with so much excitement while he slurped down his chow mein that Shannon could almost see sparks coming off the cogs in his brain. He was quickly skimming through printouts of the experiment's data streams and dripping sauce all over the pages. Okay, new theory. He said between bites. Hit me, said Shannon. It's not a flower. Sure looked like one. Henry raised his diet cubicola. Maybe it's some kind of complex protein that looks like a flower to us. Or if it was extracted from an environment frozen for millennia, perhaps it's a prehistoric form of animal life. And we melted it into what? Guts? Maybe. He said. Doubtful. No consistency with organ structure. It's a Newtonian fluid. Henry broke his chopsticks, stuffed them into his box, and tossed it in the trash. Yeah, just a theory. I don't know, Shan. Whatever this anomaly is, it's definitely carrying some sort of low-level electric charge that gets stimulated real quick. I'll need to watch the replay a few times before deciding the best way forward. When's the last time you slept, babe? She said. Wednesday night? Maybe get some shut-eye. Sleep on it. I'm fine, dear. Shannon couldn't help but smile. Henry never really had an off switch, which was a large part of why she fell in love with him. She watched him hop up and move toward a nearby terminal, report in hand. Think the video feed finished processing? He asked. Probably 10 more minutes. The power surge interrupted the usual video render, so I had to recompile everything. Henry flipped through the papers again and began fumbling around in his pocket for his cassette recorder. He pulled it out and checked the tape. Ah, uh, any chance we can lift our quarantine long enough for me to go upstairs to my office? I've got a tape I need to listen back to. Shannon shook her head. Not a chance. Rules are rules. We made the rules. I made the rules, thank you very much, Shannon said, walking over to him. And I said, get some sleep. Come on, I'll make a place to lie down and we can dim the lights. We're on to something, Shan. Shannon squeezed his tense shoulders and leaned into his ear. It'll still be here 30 minutes from now. Rest, baby. <sighs> uh, I shut my eyes and I'll be out for longer than that, he said, turning to her with a smile. I just need to play something for my dictations. I wouldn't ask if it wasn't important, love. So have Piper bring it down for you. Henry shook his head. Can't. It's under lock and key. Besides, uh, he's probably still shook up from our little light show. Hey, Henry. Yeah? What was that? She said, kissing him. I don't know. Crazy, right? Sure was pretty, though. And terrifying. Got that right. Shannon reached out and lowered the lights. Three hours later, she woke up to find Henry playing through the experiment on a monitor, quietly narrating into his recorder. Data stream suggests that the preliminary hypothesis has potential. 
Recommend further evaluation in London. Seeing Shannon rise, he abruptly punched his thumb down on the stop button and turned to her. Hey, good news. I don't have a third arm. How about you? She rubbed her eyes and feigned laughter. Funny. I'm okay, I think. So, what's in London? London? Henry, enough with the secrets. Tell me what we're experimenting on. Her husband sighed, turning away from the monitor. It's a find from an old colleague of mine. She's been spearheading an Antarctic exploration and felt I could identify the specimen. She? Shannon said, cocking her eyebrow. Before we met, love. Were you two serious? Ex-wife. Shannon shot a look at Henry, who deadpanned back. Kidding. Had dinner a few times. She was out of my league. Shannon smacked his shoulder. Henry sipped his coffee. Uh, anywho, turns out this discovery of hers might be the tip of the iceberg. The anomaly created by our little experiment needs a better lab than ours. Still, I'd like to take a few more stabs at it. Exploratory sessions, just to satisfy my curiosity. Shannon stood on her tiptoes to give him a peck on the cheek. Want me to get suited and booted? In a bit, Henry said. Still looking through the data. Check this out. Henry pointed at the screen, and Shannon watched as the replay showed the Linac firing upon the specimen. Past Henry stepped closer to watch, as past Shannon stared at the monitors. For half a second, the flower began to illuminate. Then, all at once, the recording glitched to a screen of fragmented blue and green pixels. Oh, wow, Shannon said. Loss of signal at the moment of reaction. Interference? Henry asked. Shannon shook her head. Not exactly. We'd get a solid color crash screen if it were something with the camera feed. See the random blocks popping up everywhere? That's hardware damage. The reaction didn't interfere with the lab's video feed. It literally destroyed this camera's sensor. Henry tapped a few buttons on his terminal. That's not the only one. Soon, the monitor switched to a multi-view of various feeds, all of which were burned out. Shannon turned to Henry, concerned. I specifically outfitted our lenses with polarized filters to prevent that. It would take a crazy amount of light to overload them. Meaning what, exactly? Henry said. Meaning I'm calling an oncologist, and you're calling the bank. Those cameras didn't come cheap, Henry. Are we being sarcastic right now, or are we being serious right now? He said. Serious. <whistles> Shannon's cell phone rang. She pulled it out of her pocket. Joel Piper's name stared back at her. Yes, she answered. Hey, Mrs. Kane. I uh, tried calling Henry, but he's not answering his cell. Shannon looked at her husband. Piper says he called you? Henry pulled out his phone, tapped it, and turned the black screen toward her. His battery's dead, she said. Need to talk to him? Yes, ma'am. She handed the phone over, and Henry put on a smile. How are things above ground? He asked. Shannon turned away and busied herself with re-watching the experiment. Every single camera had been damaged at the moment of reaction. The digital and thermal camera failures were to be expected, but even the analog camera and those with high durability sensors were overloaded. Yet to Shannon's memory, there hadn't been an actual explosion during the test. No burn marks, no damage, just light. What in the world is that thing? She muttered, rewinding to watch past Henry set the specimen onto the Linac. Present, Henry hung up the phone and handed it back to her. Joel's finished his duties upstairs. No problems. I sent him home for the day. I was thinking. He stopped when he saw Shannon's face. You okay? Shannon snapped out of her trance. I'm fine. You were thinking? He continued. I was thinking with Joel gone and it being just us here. Henry. Henry rolled his eyes. I was thinking you could head upstairs and get my phone charger. Oh. It's in the break room, I think. Okay. It wasn't in the break room. Shannon finally tracked the cord to an outlet behind the front desk, and after pocketing it, stopped by the restroom. She had felt dizzy since first reviewing the experiment and was eager to finish the quarantine so that she and Henry could get checked out. Shannon wasn't a hypochondriac by any stretch of the imagination, but losing her father to cancer in her teens had made her somewhat careful about regular checkups and catching things early. She scrolled through the footage of the experiment one final time on her tablet and finally switched it off. If the anomaly was dangerous, her exposure had been limited, and 
It was now safely locked away. No need to worry. She washed her hands, splashed some water on her face, and stepped out to the hallway. Making her way to the elevator, she noticed the door to the garage was cracked open. She peeked her head inside to see the loading bay was left raised. Again. Piper. Shannon grumbled and slapped the control pad to shut it. Heading down the black marble hallway, past the lockers, she stepped into the elevator and punched the basement button. The doors closed, and Shannon shut her eyes, resting her head on the wall and taking a deep breath. It had been far too long of a day. The doors opened with a chime, and Shannon made her way back into the lab. She stopped when she noticed the blinking green light above the testing chamber's airlock. Had Henry stepped out? Babe? She called. No answer. The airlock hung open, against protocol. Between Piper and her husband, it was a wonder the lab ever functioned properly. Shannon had already forgiven Henry by the time she entered the chamber to see him standing with his hands above his head, across from two men, pointing the biggest guns she had ever seen. It'll be okay, baby. Those had been the first words out of Henry's mouth as Shannon walked into the room. She froze almost immediately as one of the men trained his handgun on her. Henry, what? No talking. Against the wall, now. Shannon's legs suddenly felt very weak, and she strained to stay upright. Do what they say, Shannon, said Henry. She turned to him and tried to speak, but a frog had found its way into her throat. It was like a nightmare where her body refused to communicate or follow instructions. She's scared, Henry said to the man, lowering his arms. Let me help her to... The second man stepped forward and adjusted his aim between Henry's eyes. You don't move unless I tell you to, understand? His voice was just as calculated. Henry raised his hands back up and nodded. I understand. I'm just trying to help my wife. Best thing she can do is follow instructions before I lose my patience. Listen. Henry broke in. Let's all just lower the temperature a bit. I'm going to cooperate, all right? Just put the guns down. They aren't necessary. Then give us what we want, the man near Shannon said. And tell her to do as I say. Shannon. Henry's voice seemed distant. Shannon's knees began to buckle. Shannon. Shannon! Shannon blinked and looked at Henry. In their eight years together, he had never raised his voice to her. It hadn't been out of anger. It was panic. I need you here, love. I need you to pay attention. Then, for the briefest of moments, Henry's eyes flickered. Shannon blinked. What was he trying to say? Had he just glanced upward? No, to the side. She closed her eyes and made a mental snapshot of the room. The Linac. It was the only possible answer. Tell me you're with me. Shannon nodded slowly. I'm with you. Silently, she raised her hands and backed toward the testing chamber's wall, turning her attention to the armed man in front of her. He was bald, of medium build, and sported a goatee. The other man had golden blonde hair with a scar across his cheek. Both men were dressed all in black and carrying handguns with oversized barrels. All right, no more stalling, said Blonde. Seems you made a recent discovery. We're here to collect. Henry sighed, waving a hand toward the cart next to the Linac. I've already shown you the samples. Take them. Shannon craned her neck to see the smaller petals from the tundra specimen used at the start of the experiment, each sitting in individual petri dishes. To her horror, Shannon watched as Blonde crossed the testing chamber toward Henry and pressed the large barrel of the pistol into his forehead. Let me make something very clear, Mr. Kane, he said coldly. I know what I'm here for. Silence hung in the air. No more games. Give me what I want. Henry glanced over to Shannon, who stared back. Finally, he closed his eyes, nodded, and then spoke. You win. Footlocker, across from the chamber. I can get it. No. Said Blonde, turning to Shannon. Have her get it. Shannon looked to the man, then to Henry, then to the gun pointed at her, and finally to the footlocker containing the anomaly. Let's go. Said Blonde. Move. She took a heavy breath and began toward the footlocker. Her steps were uneven, and her mind was racing. Even as she walked, it felt like the crate was pulling further and further away from her. She had to focus. Their lives depended on it. 
Shannon dropped her hands as she bent down and lightly brushed the right pocket on her lab coat. Her cell phone and key card were safely tucked inside. If she could just triple tap the side button of her phone to activate the emergency call feature. Hands! Let's not get funny! Keep them where I can see them! Shannon stretched her fingers out and raised her arms. Good, pick it up, slowly. Shannon bent down and carefully picked up the footlocker by its handles. Then she turned around and just as carefully carried it back to the men. She passed by the other side of the lineac to put distance between herself and the intruders, noting to herself that the machine was still in rest mode, shuddered since the failsafe stop. It could be reactivated in seconds. She set the footlocker down and stepped away, putting her hands back up. She looked to Henry, who calmly nodded to her reassuringly. Blonde looked down at the chest. Password. Still staring at his wife, Henry gave a small smile. Um... O. A. B. Shannon's eyes welled. Blonde nodded to Bald, who holstered his gun and bent in front of the crate's keypad to unlock it. He punched in the code and raised the lid. Inside was the anomaly, still glowing a distinctive pink inside its cryogenic glass vial. Bald picked it up and showed it to Blonde, who calmly stepped back several paces and leveled his pistol. Shannon's eyes blinked at the sound of the gunshot. Henry Kane's body fell to the floor. Shannon went cold as an invisible knife slashed across her chest and stopped her heart. Then, in an instant, she surrendered to pure instinct. She placed her foot on the edge of the locker and thrust it forward to knock the blonde man off his feet. She turned and bolted toward the lineup, throwing herself behind the machine as a bullet zipped past her ear. Down went her hand for the key card in her pocket. She slapped it across the scanner, and when the Linax shutters flipped open, she grabbed the intensity dial and cranked it. The machine roared to life, and Shannon pulled the control lever. A bright beam burst out of the device, and she heard a terrified scream as the laser cut through the air, severing Bald's right hand. Gunshots rang out again, and Shannon ducked, wildly swinging the controls leftward and rightward. She thought to herself, before they kill me. Lights flickered, glass shattered, sparks flew, a fire ignited somewhere, and finally the power to the room was cut. She knew the outage would only last about 15 seconds before the emergency backup generator turned on. Could she make it out in time? Her shoes crunched on broken beakers scattered across the floor, and she gritted her teeth as gunshots rang out. Equipment exploded all around her, and something heavy fell on her head. She saw stars, and her legs gave out from under her. Sharp glass tore into her face and arms as she made contact with the lab's marble surface. Her hearing swirled. The sounds of the men shouting seemed far away, but Shannon fought to stay awake. And when the emergency lights sputtered to life, her world came back into focus. The entire chamber was ablaze, and heavy smoke permeated the air. Blonde was looking every which way in a panicked state, while Bald lay balled up, clutching his arm. Shannon knew little about guns, but had seen enough cheesy action movies to tell by the locked back slides that they were now empty. She tried to move, but couldn't. Unsure whether she had been concussed or if her leg was broken, Shannon took solace that it was at least easier to breathe while close to the floor. Finally, Blonde spotted her. He raised his pistol and then remembered it was out of ammunition. With a curse, he holstered the firearm and began to step toward her. Then, a ceiling panel gave way and fell between them, sending hot flames spewing outward. Blonde hopped back with a shout, and Shannon's head turned toward the sound of the chamber's entrance. Opening. Joel Piper entered the room looking utterly astonished. His eyes first fell on Henry, then on Shannon, then Blonde, who struggled to help Bald to his feet amid the flames. His voice was panicked as he shouted at the two men. Let's go! Shannon watched in disbelief as the intruders made their way toward him and then out of the chamber. Joel turned to lock eyes with her for only a moment. Then he followed the men through the exit and locked the door. Confusion gave way to rage, and then panic. Henry. She had to help Henry. The dense smoke was disorienting, and Shannon knew that she wouldn't be able to carry him. 
Their only chance was the emergency fire protection system. Why hadn't it been activated yet? Mustering every ounce of strength in her bones, Shannon lifted herself and staggered toward the Linac. She located her keycard hanging from the control panel and grabbed it, turning back to the door. A ceiling tile dropped behind her, sending embers across her back. She screamed out in pain and fell forward onto broken glass. Blood poured from her arms, and she fought in agony against the stinging to get to her feet and then barreled toward the door. With a scan of her keycard, it unlocked. Flames were quickly spreading to the airlock, and Shannon made her way slowly through the room, wary of whether the men would decide to come back. Crossing through the airlock and down the hall, she collapsed onto the observation terminal and groped around blindly for the emergency fire control. By now, her eyes were filled with a mixture of blood, tears, and smoke, preventing her from seeing clearly. At last, her blood-slicked skin found the lever, and she pulled. Alarms sounded, tearing through her skull. Water began to pour down from above, first from the sprinklers hanging over the testing chamber, then the airlock, and finally above her head. By now, Shannon had lost feeling in her legs, and she crawled back through the airlock in search of her husband. Henry. <laughs> Henry. Her voice sounded inhuman. Dragging herself back through the glass, smoke, and pooling water, she found Henry's body and knew for certain. She curled against his chest, as she had for so many nights, then pressed her forehead against his and closed her eyes. With the light of her world now gone, Shannon Kane slipped away. The Spider Queen by Austin McConnell and Elizabeth McIver is available now. Get the rest of the story by visiting the link in this video's description.